Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending today's panel discussion on what's next for endometriosis care in the United Kingdom. I would especially like to thank our speakers, Amy James Kelly, a Manchester-based actress who's going to tell us about her experiences living with endometriosis. Dr. Louisa Corder, Medical Ambassador for Endometriosis UK, gynaecologist, obstetrician, and champion of women's rights and women's health. Neelam Hira, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Sisters, and of course, the wonderful CEO of Endometriosis UK, Emma Cox. So today's panel discussion is particularly important as yesterday marked the first day of Endometriosis Awareness Month. Endometriosis is still unknown to many people and sadly seen by some as a taboo subject. We must talk and raise awareness of this condition so that people do not have their symptoms dismissed as normal and something they must learn to live with. It is more important than ever that we make sure that the one and a half million people living with this condition are given a voice and through the all party parliamentary group, that is exactly what myself and my fellow members of the group intend to do. We learned from the inquiry that we held last year just how debilitating endometriosis can be and how it can impact on all aspects of a person's life. We heard from over 10,000 people, quite remarkable, through our patient survey and held four oral evidence sessions, both in Parliament and virtually. The findings of this inquiry were published in a report in October last year and showed the stark reality of what it is like to live with endometriosis. We were shocked to learn that despite affecting a huge number of people, there has been no improvement to diagnosis times in the last decade. This is ridiculous and unacceptable. The average time for diagnosis is still eight years. Crazy. This delay not only impacts on a person's physical health, but just as importantly, also their mental well-being. 81% of those who completed our survey reported that endometriosis has impacted their mental health negatively or very negatively. In addition to this, 90% expressed that they would have liked access to psychological support, but were not offered any. We also know that like many other conditions, those suffering from endometriosis have been hugely affected by the coronavirus pandemic and the subsequent impact on the provision of health services across the United Kingdom. This has only worked to increase the anxieties which people feel as many have had their surgeries cancelled and their treatments delayed. Extremely stressful. The coronavirus pandemic has made the need for improvements to endometriosis care even more urgent. We know only too well that left untreated, the disease may progress and impact further on a person's quality of life. Diagnosis times must decrease to ensure those with endometriosis get access to the treatment that they need. As part of the recommendations of our inquiry, the all-party parliamentary group is seeking a commitment from governments in all four nations to reduce average diagnosis times for endometriosis, with targets of four years or less by 2025 and a year or less by 2030. We were, of course, very pleased to have the Minister Nadine Dorries present at our report launch last October and to hear her commit to working alongside the all-party parliamentary group to make sure that changes are made to improve the lives of those with endometriosis. Endometriosis Awareness Month, uh, ladies, and there are some gentlemen, is the perfect time to make sure that the devastating findings of our report about the impact that endometriosis can have on a person's life are not forgotten and real change is made for the one and a half million people living with this condition. I couldn't 
be not more pleased than so many people have joined together today. A really good turnout. I'm delighted uh, to talk about this important issue. I would now like to introduce our first speaker, who is Emma Cox. As many of you know, uh, Emma is the Chief Executive Officer of Endometriosis UK, which does an absolutely wonderful job in providing the Secretariat for our all-party parliamentary group. Emma is going to speak to us today about the current state of play of endometriosis care in the United Kingdom. Emma, can we hear from you, please? Thank you, Sir David. Um, I have a, a quick um, public service announcement. announcement. Um, if you want to ask questions, there is a Q&A function, not a chat function, a Q&A function. So if you want to use that, please do. And some of you have found it already. Um, and thank you, Sir David, um, for, for your introduction there. Um, what I wanted to, to kick off with was um, just talking about some findings that we've released recently for Awareness Month around um, attitudes to people about endometriosis, because I think we, we all know, um, everyone on this call will know the huge impact that endometriosis uh, can have on individuals. Um, and what we found is that um, when questioned, 62% of women aged 16 to 54 would be put off going to the doctor if they had symptoms of endometriosis. Um, and that would rise to 80% of 16 to 24 year olds. So we know that um, not only is it can be difficult to live with, but that we um, have a condition that for various societal taboos, um, embarrassment or thinking that it's normal people just don't want to uh, don't necessarily uh, feel confident to go and, and get help with their symptoms um, and that's why events like this and all the work we all do and many people across the UK do to raise awareness is so vital because unless people realize that what they're experiencing is symptoms of a disease and not something normal they won't go and seek help. Um, and we all have a part to play in ensuring that we support people where they have symptoms rather than minimising them. Um, so as well as 62% um, of people saying they wouldn't go to the doctor with symptoms of endometriosis, 47% um, of, of uh, females aged 16 to 54 said they'd be concerned to tell their employers. And that raised to 57% of 16 to 34 year olds. And I think one of the things that for me is one of the real motivations between so much of what we do is how do we support people at all stages of their career, but also those coming into work who have a red recognized medical condition to be able to fulfill their potential um, and take an active role in work when quite often um, their symptoms are minimized and I'm sure people have been brushed off with, well, everyone has periods, get on with it. This is not a bad period. This is something completely different. And we, you know, our job is to make sure everyone here that's loud and clear. Um, and I think for, for, for us, therefore, and, and the main focus of Awareness uh, Month is really that need to break down stigma. Um, and it's so vital that workplaces, um, as well as uh, the government, wake up to the fact that the endometriosis is a condition that will affect 10% of all the women and those assigned female at birth in their workforce. That's a large number of people. And put in place the support and access that people need to, to do uh, the work they want to do and to live lives to the full. Um, we know there's been a massive impact of COVID um, and I was talking to someone just the other day um, who was awaiting an appointment to talk about surgery now over a year ago and still hasn't heard when they will be having that appointment to then discuss the surgery they need. And I think that we all understand um, that the terrible impact has been on the NHS, but a real call, um, and I know Sir David will support this, but a real call to ensure that as services are resumed um, in the NHS, that menstrual conditions and endometriosis are given due priority, recognising the impact they can have and are not slipped to the bottom of the list or overlooked or forgotten as sadly so many um, women's health, as it's always called, issues are, um, and that the, these need to be taken seriously for both physical and mental uh, health aspects they have on people's lives. Um, and we'll be working very hard with the All Party Parliamentary Group, um, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists and the Royal College of GPs to ensure that that due priority is afforded to those as, some, um, as 
services resume but also to look at what can we learn because we know that there's a big waiting list now I mean I'm sure Dr Lewis will say no more than me but you know there's literally millions of, of appointments that have been missed in surgery how do we support people in the meantime um, and so also working uh, with all the healthcare professionals to look at what can we learn what can we do how do we provide pain management how do we provide access to fertility treatment how do we provide access to care in a way that people can access without just having to wait to see when a letter comes through their door. So there's a lot that we need to be doing on that. Um, and I think we have, if you like, um, we have sort of four, four requests, main requests we're pushing for awareness uh, month. Um, and the first one, which um, Sir David's already mentioned, is like a real commitment from all the four UK governments to drive down diagnosis time. It is shockingly unacceptable that that hasn't changed in a decade. Um, it's an average of eight years at the moment, and that should be, uh, we'd like to see that a year or less by 2030. Um, and we know that it can be done. Some people get diagnosed really quickly when they see, um, they recognise their own symptoms, they seek help promptly, and the healthcare professionals they're talking to recognise the symptoms. It can be done well. That needs to be what everyone receives, not just what some people receive. We want there to be a minimum baseline for treatment of what treatment people get wherever they live in the UK. Um, and we have uh, NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Health, excellent, has guidelines of what the care should be in the UK. These haven't been fully implemented and they need to be. And that would make sure that there's prompt diagnosis and that wherever people live, they would have access to the care, including specialist care, should they need that. Um, we would like to see a commitment from all four nations to include menstrual well-being, education in the school curriculum. Delighted to say that England have now done that from September that's being taught. And I know Sir David and Emma Hardy um, saw the minister quite recently to make sure that they were holding him to account, literally, because his team called us to check, um, that um, making sure that endometriosis um, is mentioned at age appropriately in secondary school and that all children are taught um, from primary and secondary appropriate menstrual well-being. Being. but we need that in the other four nations now so that's our push going forward um, and the other key ask for us is that we want to see um, employers recognize the impact endometriosis can have and just like they would any other medical condition to support their employees to work well with endometriosis um, we are we do have a campaign at the moment a little bit of a plug we are encouraging everybody to write to their mps um, and to push for every mp to um, make a commitment to ask for diagnosis time to be decreased so all of you listening except if you're an mp obviously um uh, all of those you listening can write uh, can write to your MPs and actually ask them to uh, to make the commitment to you as a constituent to drive down diagnosis time and there's details for that on our website. So, um, so David, that's the things I wanted to cover. So I'm um, believe I'm now handing over to Amy if that's okay. Thank you, Emma. And uh, we're now going to hear from Amy James Kelly. Uh, she is our um, next speaker, and she happens to be an actress based in Manchester. Uh, she's played some iconic roles in Coronation Street, Safe Gentlemen, uh, Jack and Military Wives. And she's going to tell us today about her experiences living with endometriosis. So Amy, please. David, um, I'd like to start by asking you all to go back 15 years. So the year is 2006. Maybe you've just got a new job, had a child, or maybe you've moved house. Well, a friend of mine was having her first appointment for chronic pain, problem periods, symptoms she didn't yet understand or even believe to be related. For 15 years, she was misdiagnosed, dismissed by multiple GPs, referred to the wrong department and then re-referred, told it was all in her head. And when she eventually did manage to get pregnant, she eventually had to have a full hysterectomy and, and part of her colon removed. So again, thinking back to 2006 and all that's happened in your life since, along with the regular stresses of normal life. For 15 years, imagine dealing with not only extreme pain, but pain that you don't understand because you're told it doesn't exist. 15 years of bleeding from every orifice, I'm gonna be graphic because that's the reality of this disease, sleeping days away and losing friends and romantic partners, but above all, not knowing why. This is the disturbing and terrifying reality for at least one and a half million people in the UK. That equates to one in 10, i.e. you probably know someone with endometriosis. Now that one and a half million 
is nearly the entire population of Northern Ireland. So imagine an entire country with an incurable condition, and though they may experience the symptoms slightly differently, most share the experience of being told it's all in your head. The mental health impact of being accused of overreacting or being weak or even delusional is painfully ironic. That leads me nicely on to, so as you mentioned before, Sir David, with the um, over 10,000 participants in the last um, inquiry, 90% of those surveyed said that they would have liked psychological support but weren't offered this. Now, speaking from my own journey, in my experience, the mental health impacts are equal to, if not just as equal to, or if not worse than the physical pain that endometriosis is famous for. So this means that if such a debilitating condition is suspected, let alone diagnosed, then integrated into the patient's treatment and care needs to be some sort of psychological support. Now the psychological and social impacts of this disease include, but are not limited to, pain that we've already mentioned, which is often unpredictable, not only can it prevent you from having a family, but above all, it can prevent you from having a normal life, which I'll come back to in a second. But all of this, whilst your shiny new condition is considered taboo simply because it involves vaginas and periods. To be dumped with all of this as an outlook for potentially the rest of your life with no more than an off you pop, come back when it's unbearable again and we'll cut you open. It's unfair and it's unsustainable, especially considering endometriosis has now been found to be just as common as diabetes. Now, we as endo patients understand that research and medical advancement of any kind takes time. But in the meantime, we can no longer be left to feel isolated, hopeless, or often unworthy of love. Now, revisiting my reference to normal life, I'm self-employed. And because of this, I was forced to fund my own surgery and all of the prior tests and scans. Because being self-employed, not having an official diagnosis is a nightmare for insurance purposes and can make you a high risk option for an employer. But also I had such extreme symptoms, I was in and out of hospital very frequently, which as an actor is less than convenient because no one can stand in for you if you're sick. Now I'm in the fortunate enough position that I had savings to cover that. But very often that is not the case for the majority of those needing diagnosis, further investigations and treatment. Many are left in limbo waiting for this care for a year plus and left with impacting in, sorry, can't get my words out. <laughs> um, many are left in limbo waiting for this care for over a year and they're left with the um, inability to get or keep work. Um, the repercussions of this are obvious, not just financial, but psychological. Now, regardless of financial status, no one should have to wake up from surgery to be relieved that they've been diagnosed with an incurable disease. And that relief comes purely from being proved sane, from being told that you weren't overthinking or attention seeking after all. But that relief alone cannot nourish you, which is where I come back to the last APPG inquiry in October. The promise of commitment to reduce the diagnosis of eight to four years has to start with the way patients are treated in appointments. What those 90% of participants probably needed was integrated mental health care, as I mentioned earlier, as part of their journey. We can no longer see the psychological and physical symptoms of endometriosis as two separate things, i.e. as soon as endo is suspected, a patient should be supported in both of these areas. In addition, being referred by a GP to a specialist understandably has to be a box ticking exercise to some extent, but as I said earlier, if everyone experiences the symptoms slightly differently, then even if a patient isn't ticking all of the boxes all of the time, eventually longevity of symptoms has to speak for themselves. I also want to take this time to reference one particularly disturbing piece of advice. Um, I use the term loosely. I received on two separate occasions by older male gynecologists, and that's maybe go and have a baby as this would get rid of your symptoms or at least put your pain into perspective. We have to stop telling young girls and women to gamble such a life changing decision. And we cannot maintain the attitude that to cover up half of the symptoms, then someone should just get on with it. This current approach resembles shoving all of your toys into a cupboard and not considering the mess a problem until it all falls out on you. We must listen to patients, involve them in studies, and we need the government to provide funding and education for not only medical professionals, but young girls and boys alike nationwide. This can begin by teaching people of all ages, but primarily those facing such changes such as puberty, what is normal. To do this, we must remove the taboo around such a natural part of life. 
And I'd like to finish by saying every now and then I still struggle to wrap my head around the fact that this is it now, this is my life. And I can't help but think how differently the last few years might have been if I was supported in a better way. Now for a closing statement, I thought, don't go overboard. Don't say how you feel like a dead weight um, to important people in my life. Don't say that you sometimes feel like a burden to your partner. Don't say that to a group of strangers, but that defeats the object because that's exactly what you do need to hear. Too many women feel like burdens, but we are burdened. Too many endometriosis patients feel tiresome, but we're tired. Too many people with these symptoms and or this disease are called hysterical, dramatic, or even weak because they can't deal with simply having a uterus. But we've been driven to hysteria. This drama is our reality. And we are advocating and fighting for ourselves every single day. Now, in my opinion, that's not weak, that's strong. But we desperately need and deserve the correct and appropriate help in both quantity and quality. Thank you. Well, Amy, thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Um, it was so powerful to listen to your te testimony. And uh, I think you have uh, given all of us a very powerful message. And in spite of all the problems you face, you've already achieved so much, really. So I hope that will encourage other people. Thank you very much indeed. Very grateful. And now we turn to Dr. Larissa Corder. Um, Dr. Larissa Corder is going to give us her insight from a medical perspective. She is a medical ambassador for Endometriosis UK, a gynecologist and an obstetrician. She is a powerful champion of women's rights and women's health and is also a fertility expert working in the NHS. And you might have seen her discussing women's health issues on this morning, Loose Women and Lorraine. Over to you, Larissa. Thank you, Sir David. And, and thank you, Emma and um, Amy, for two incredibly powerful accounts and perspectives on this terrible, terrible condition. And I'm going to try and give it as much justice as, as you have um, and, and speak from the medical perspective um, as well as the social perspective. So this is a disease that affects 176 million people who've been assigned female at birth all around the world. It's a disease that's just as common and just as prevalent as diabetes. One in 10 of us, even at this meeting, will have endometriosis and it costs the UK economy 8.2 billion pounds every year alone. Yet, not many people have heard of endometriosis, let alone understand what it is or how it affects women. And I think part of the reason behind this is that this condition is steeped in taboo from every possible angle, culturally, generationally, societally, and medically as well. We'd rather discuss anything else aside from periods and menstruation, in fact, we've created 500 other terms and euphemisms we'd rather use than actually the word period itself. And this starts from a very young and early age when many girls are fed lots of misperceptions and mistruths and are too afraid and too scared to discuss their own bodies and what menstruation actually means. So from the time a young girl starts having her periods, if she experiences any pain, Quite incorrectly, well-intentioned relatives or people might tell her that it's just part of being a woman. It's something she has to get used to. And a GP that she might go and see will tell her that it's all probably normal and she doesn't need to worry. But there's nothing normal about this condition. And it's why 60% of women who have pains directly related to their periods end up being diagnosed with endometriosis, except this occurs, as we've just heard, around eight to 10 years down the line. And it's also why 90% of women with chronic pelvic pain also have this condition, but have no idea that they're living with something that is treatable and that could in fact be diagnosed much earlier than it actually is. And because as we've just heard from Amy, this is a generational thing that for many centuries, women have been blamed for being melodramatic, for over-exaggerating their symptoms, 
for perhaps reporting symptoms that they don't have, this is directly fed into our medical culture as well and into the gender bias that we see today. And in fact, a very recent report has recently revealed that when men and women present to care in A&E and with pain, we saw on average that women take 15 minutes longer to receive any kind of pain relief for their condition. 15 minutes longer than any man who's also waiting in a &E. And that's simply due to the gender bias which exists in our modern societies, in our modern hospitals around the globe, including the UK. This is utterly unacceptable. And actually, if you think about it, this is a bias against that part of our population that endures labour and that quite often will go through labour without any pain relief alone. This is a part of our society where I'm yet to meet a person who actually exaggerates their pain. In fact, I see the very opposite. I see that women underestimate their pain. And this is also part of the issue as to why there are so many delays in diagnosis, because quite often women won't necessarily report pain. And if they do, that pain tends to be quite severe and incredibly difficult to manage just with painkillers alone. So something's going wrong here and the misperceptions and the myths are leaving behind a generational legacy that many young girls and women have inherited today. And somehow we have to overturn this. Somehow we have to change this dialogue. We have to stop it and we have to turn around the whole conversation all to do with endometriosis. We need proper education that starts in our schools from a younger age where boys and girls are educated about periods, about menstruation and specifically about endometriosis so that young women have the confidence to be able to have a conversation about this with their relatives, with their friends and with their doctors. And so that we reduce that incredible average of eight years that women have to wait before that diagnosis is made. But let me be frank about this. This is not just a societal problem of various different attitudes that we have inherited. This is very much a medical problem that exists in all of our communities. This is a problem where many doctors aren't educated in the disease. There isn't enough awareness about it. And so it means that actually it takes on average a woman around seven different specialists to see her before someone correctly diagnoses the fact that she may have endometriosis. Now, endometriosis is a complex disease. There are many overlapping symptoms that can occur, and that's to do with the fact that it can invade many other organs. It's multisystemic, it's multidimensional, it's complex, and lots of people don't necessarily understand it, and that includes many doctors. There isn't enough research into the entire subject, let alone research into a cure when we don't even understand what we're dealing with. In addition to which, many young girls get put on the oral contraceptive or any kind of hormonal contraceptive. And the thing about this is that actually these contraceptives also act to suppress any symptoms of endometriosis. So it could be that a girl or a woman has this condition, but she doesn't know it until she eventually comes off the hormones and begins to try for a family except she doesn't realize that she might be 50% of those women with endometriosis who will struggle to be able to have children. And by the time she comes to get her diagnosis and comes to seek any treatment to help her to become pregnant, what we find is that quite often her ovarian reserve is severely diminished. She's lost out on all of that time when she could have been planning ahead, potentially even freezing her eggs or having children slightly earlier down the line without realizing that she has a condition that will affect her ability not just to get pregnant, but will affect potentially the rest of her life. Because that's the other myth, that we think that endometriosis stops just at the age of menopause, but for around 2% of women, it doesn't. And there are so many other myths that surround this condition that also directly affect many cl clinicians, that it means women don't even have any kind of chance of getting this diagnosis at a point in time when it will serve them best in their lives. It's absolutely crucial that we invest in earlier diagnosis and that we provide the specialist centers and services that are capable of diagnosing this condition and ultimately in treating it. But let's just talk for a second about what endometriosis actually is. 
So first and foremost, this is an inflammatory condition that's associated with what we call ectopic tissue. So this is tissue that doesn't belong to that particular space and place as to where it's found. We don't quite understand why that tissue is found there, but we do know through various different studies that the genes which are expressed in this abnormal tissue can be very similar to cancer. Yet we know that endometriosis in itself doesn't cause cancer. It just behaves like cancer, which means it can invade lots of other organs like your bladder, like your bowels, and which makes it complicated to diagnose because a woman may not just present with pain around her periods, but she may present with pain that's related to sex, that's related to bowel opening, that's related to urination, and that could ultimately also make her bloated. So there's a whole variety of signs and symptoms that exist with endometriosis, which is what makes it so, so difficult to diagnose. But when we talk about pain, which is the predominant symptom of endometriosis and is the thing that a lot of women suffer with, we need to understand why that pain occurs. So this abnormal tissue that's found outside of the uterus reacts in exactly the same way as the lining of the womb. It responds to hormones. So that means it swells, it bleeds, it becomes inflamed. And as a result of that, it can push and compress other adjacent organs causing pain. But more than that, recent research has also discovered that patients with endometriosis are also affected in terms of their actual brain structures. So we know that there are specific parts of the brain called the hippocampus and amygdala, which are responsible for memory and also emotions, as well as cognition, where gene expression is directly affected by endometriosis. This means that women's perception of pain is far greater when they have the condition of endometriosis. And this makes them particularly prone to depression, to stress, and to anxieties. And in fact, that's what the report has also discovered, that around 90% of women who suffer with this condition also report having symptoms of depression and also of suffering with anxieties. So women are carrying not only a mental burden that's initiated by our societies through the fear, isolation and judgment that they experience, but the mental health burden is also being driven biochemically and biologically. What's more, the whole process of inflammation in itself predisposes an individual to depression. And when you have chronic inflammation, like someone with endometriosis does, we also know that it's particularly difficult to treat because regular antidepressants don't work in this group of patients. They don't have the same effect as those without inflammation. And this is what makes the mental health component so difficult to treat. But yet when you see someone with endometriosis or an average doctor looks at someone with endometriosis, they don't necessarily realize that this is a multidimensional condition where the mental health aspect absolutely needs to be taken into account. And women need to be seen holistically and treated as such with a number of different specialists instead of just focusing on the physical symptoms alone. So women are not only carrying the burden of very real physical pain that they're experiencing, but also the harrowing emotional pain of increased infertility, increased rates of miscarriage, increased damage to their self-confidence, their intimate relationships, social relationships, their careers, their jobs, and their education without anyone listening. They're pleading to be heard in their homes, in their schools, in the hospitals, in their jobs, in their careers, they're pleading to be acknowledged and to validated, and yet so often they're not. So what kind of solutions can we hope to offer? And I think Emma and Amy have already alluded to these, and I'll just add my piece for what it's worth. I think, as I've mentioned, it's really, really important that we begin educating young children, that includes boys and girls at schools, that we stop being ashamed of using terms like periods and menstruation, and we start to make it part of normal conversation and normal dialogue, that we start encouraging girls to seek help and to seek treatment from a much younger age. And if they get refused by one particular doctor, they go again and they represent and they take themselves seriously. We need to encourage every single young woman and also girl to be their own advocate to take their own health seriously and to encourage others to also talk about this condition and this disease. 
And medically, we need to start restructuring our entire system. We need to start raising awareness within the medical profession about endometriosis, what it actually is. And we need to start getting rid of old archaic views about this condition and how to treat it. We need to invest more money into research, looking at how we directly influence gene expression. We know that there's a really significant genetic component to this disease that we're becoming more and more aware of. And we need to invest in solutions that are modern and are up to date instead of removing women's uteruses and expecting them to get better by that because they don't. It isn't a cure. We don't have a cure yet. Any hormonal means of management that we do have or surgical means of ablation and excision do not cure this condition. There is a significant risk of recurrence and at best all we're doing is trying to suppress and repress it, but we're not curing it. We need to first of all understand why it's happening and that will take some time as well as research. And the final thing I want to say is that we need to start being brave enough to implement policies and pressure on employers to start taking this seriously and to act with fairness and compassion towards women who have endometriosis so that no woman who has this condition feels too scared to go to work so that no woman feels the fear of presenting this to her employer because she's scared that she may get dismissed. We need to start bringing endometriosis into the mainstream. It needs to become something that we're not ashamed to discuss. And it needs to be something we start building healthier attitudes towards. Our societies, our economies, the wealth, health and prosperity of all of our nations absolutely depend on it. Well, Larissa, I can see why you're, you are our ambassador. That was a very, <laughs> very powerful presentation. Uh, and can you send me this evidence about women having to wait 15 minutes longer than men? I have mm. something to bring up in yes. the comments. This is crazy. I mean, I've always said that women stand pain much more than we men uh, and, and, and uh, don't complain about it as much. And your point yeah. about education is well made and uh, it is disappointing. There's no cure yet. But in, anyway, we're we press on regardless, but thank you, Larissa. And now, certainly, last but not least, I'd now like to introduce Neelam Hira. Uh, Neelam is the Chief Executive Officer and founder of Sisters, an organisation championing the rights of people affected by menstrual health conditions, including endometriosis, and representing those from underrepresented groups. So, Neelam, could we hear from you, please? Hello everyone. I'm just going to share my screen with you because I've got a couple of slides. Can you just let me know if you can see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so just to give you a background of what Sisters is and what we do as an organization. So Sisters was named after my ovarian cyst. Um, and we aim to try and use as much inclusive language as possible around the conversation around endometriosis um, and reproductive well-being generally, because um, we recognize that this table is not big enough. There are people that are underrepresented here, that are people that do not identify as women, that are non-binary, and we really want to encapsulate everyone into the conversation. So Sisters was born out of frustration. I'm a South Asian woman, as you can all probably see. And um, I felt that there was a lot of medical biases when I was getting my um, diagnosis. And um, there's not much research into um, endometriosis from an intersectional lens. And we want to try and change that and see if we can get rid of some of the medical biases around that. So we were at the APPG this time last year. So has anything actually changed? So minority communities are still hidden in plain sight. The lack of representation around endometriosis and the imagery and language used is often heteronormative in nature and typically seen as white women presenting with this pain. So for women of color and LGBT communities, you can't be what you can't see. And this is what a lot of um, women within sisters have said to us that they feel like they're not um, part of this endometriosis group because they've never been represented on that level and it was seen as a white woman's disease for a long time and those archaic views are still being carried through into the communities grassroots communities today so there's a real need to recognize intersectionality and that double discrimination faced by patients we know from the APPG reports that women are shown not to be listened to this is 
a double discrimination for those that are people of color, those from LGBT backgrounds. And we really need to recognize them as additional barriers here. Like um, Laura was saying, um, there is problems within the NHS around these additional barriers and there's a recognition of that, but we need to do more to work with those communities that we know are suffering in silence. So in relation to mental health, um, what's interesting is those from BME backgrounds are still largely underrepresented around the conversation around mental health. It's not spoken about due to cultural issues. So if I give you an example, my, um, my mother tongue is Punjabi. The direct translation for mental health in Punjabi, there, there isn't one. There isn't even one for endometriosis. You, you've got that um, language barrier for be people that don't have English as a first language as well. And it's important to recognize that. There's a lot of work going on within South Asian communities at the moment around mental health, but we need to recognize that is a barrier to treating someone holistically as well. And often patients are told about the diagnosis, but they're not offered them any follow-ups or support afterwards, whether that is during the pandemic or pre-pandemic. So it's worth noting that this isn't being exacerbated by the pandemic. These problems have been occurring beyond then. So just some statistics for you for people um, in these minority spaces. And these all feed into why we are having problems within the particular space of endometriosis. As some of you may know, black women are five times more likely to die in childbirth. Depressive disorders are much higher in South Asian communities than from any other ethnicity. And this links into the endometriosis story. If you're a South Asian woman, you have endometriosis. Not only do you have a debilitating long-term condition, as a South Asian woman, you're more likely to have depressive disorder. And these are things to take into account when diagnosing people of color. Black people are more likely to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act, and that's four times more likely than white people. Other reproductive health conditions such as fibroids are more likely to appear in black communities, which is important because these conditions largely overlap each other in terms of the chronic pain and bleeding, et cetera, and often can be misdiagnosed. A number of people in sisters um, were initially misdiagnosed as just having PCOS first before that was later um, re-diagnosed into PCOS and endometriosis or endometriosis. Trans males and sisters that we've worked with have reported that they're often misgendered within the peer-to-peer -peer support group spaces. And that's really important that we actually don't do that because that doesn't help the journey for them. And it's really important to use the correct pronouns for them going forward. An NHS audit found that the integral processes that work with integrated care, et cetera, lack that rigidness when working with those from transgender communities. And we need to take, um, we can't use a, a one size fits all approach. It simply doesn't work for minority communities and communities of color. The risk of endometriosis has been linked to ethnicity and seven studies have showed a nine fold increase in Asian women. And I think that's a huge statistic that we should be shouting about. Um, and I've got all the, the links for you if people want to read them, but it's so important that we recognize things like that because it's massive. Medical gaslighting is massively um, reported within sisters as a huge barrier to the healthcare. And those of you that haven't come across the term medical gaslighting or have just come across it now, it's when healthcare professionals downplay or blow off symptoms to convince patients that their issues are caused by something else. And we've seen that within the report from the APPG that women aren't listened to, that medical gaslighting is seen throughout that report. So what have sisters been doing off the back of that last year? What have we been trying to do? How are we trying to support this? We've been highlighting patient voices in all communities. We're using an intersectional and inclusive report, support system and approach to these communities, but we don't do these things without them. The table for sisters is inclusive and we demand that going forward for everybody because without the people who have going through these journeys, without the patient voice, we can't make any differences. The patient voice is so powerful and so important to making these changes. And we need to remember how powerful these voices are. So we've created safe spaces for these conversations. And more often than not, there's no spaces for people of color and the LGBT community due to the cultural and faith-based barriers. 
And sisters, we've worked with a number of organizations to facilitate safe spaces and collaborate with people because we don't believe we're the experts. You know, we want to work with people. We, we want to grow our reach and we want to make sure that we're working with the communities that most need us. We also changed our charity name to become more inclusive that didn't identify as women but still have reproductive health issues and that has increased our membership but in turn has allowed um, people to come out to us um, and they have often been called hidden groups but they're no longer hidden because they've actually got a space at the table now and part of the work we've done is offering mental health first aid training for these community groups because we know endometriosis is so supported online offline by peer-to-peer -peer support groups so it's really important that we also learn to recognize our own mental health and that of those around us so i've got a couple of patient journeys for you just to give you a background of some of the work that we've done and some of the things that we come across so patient a um it lives in birmingham struggled with fertility and chronic pain for a number of years she's um, married to an indian national who doesn't understand chronic illnesses and reproductive health and this has in turn impacted their marriage. He's of the belief um, that the physical pelvic pain that she's in is a result of years of sexual promiscuity. And this is years of um, um, cultural issues within um, this space, within the conversation around sex and reproductive health generally. And um, going back to a point that Larissa made earlier, um, he doesn't understand how the contraceptive pills were offered as a pathway to support around endometriosis care. He doesn't understand why that was done if there was no sexual promiscuity and this is a result of a lack of education that's why it's so important to educate everyone so this has resulted in fractured relationships across the family when the patient themselves who is going through endometriosis needs that support the most her mental health has declined as well as physical health and she disclosed um, some of these issues with her marriage because of the endometriosis to her healthcare professional who commented that she should try and meet somebody who is British and understands British values. Because as I said, he is an Indian, Indian national. So this conversation, whilst may, may have been with the best intentions from the healthcare professional, has now only widened the gap between the patient and the healthcare professional. To date, she's not had any support around her mental well-being because of those comments. She doesn't feel like she can go back to the NHS and she's actually now being supported by a third sector organization that we work with who specialize in supporting Asian women. Patient B is a Pakistani national. She's currently on a student visa in the middle of a student visa in the UK. Well-educated, academically bright, and but have a, since her teens, she's had chronic pelvic pain and bleeding. All the signs point to endometriosis. She's been to A&E on several occasions and has blacked out and I think four, she said. She's been informed that she can't have a diagnostic laparoscopy to look for endometriosis because she's a Pakistani national. So despite paying fees to live and study in the UK and not actually understanding how to navigate the NHS, um, she's been left in a position she can't get any help. Um, when speaking to a healthcare professional, um, her diet was also commented on because what we advise people and sisters to do is keep a food diary, a pain diary, and then take that with you to the GP. So her diet was commented on being inflammatory as it reflects a typical South Asian diet. Um, and these sort of medical microaggressions, medical gaslighting plays a huge part in that diagnosis journey for minority communities and plays into widening that gap between communities of color and the NHS. Um, since our support and intervention, she's actually been referred to a gynecologist and that is actually on the pathway to care now. But it's just really important that we recognize this is happening now. This is not, we're not talking from a few years ago. We're not talking, we're talking since the last report, since we've been shouting about endometriosis, this is a real thing and happening to people around us. Um, patient C is from the LGBT community. She's had endo since her late teens. She's you know, understands endo, she knows the pathway to care, she can work with the NHS. However, she's never said that she wanted children. And when speaking to a healthcare professional, she feels that her endo journey isn't taken seriously because she doesn't want children. She's reported that each time she speaks to a healthcare professional um, on multiple occasions, she is asked if she wants children. And she feels that her fertility has become the baseline for the healthcare professional to intervene and get her the treatment that she needs. 
And fertility shouldn't be the basis of that referral. And women shouldn't live in pain if they do not want to have children. So for her, she again faces that double discrimination. She's now actually gone um, private treatment to get her the support she needs, but that shouldn't have happened in the first place. So what can we do better? There's a lot we can do better, to be honest. Um, we recognize the NHS can't do everything and we wanna be able to support and reach into these communities on their behalf. But there really needs to be a recognition that the patient voice needs to be central to the conversation. And that patient voice um, cannot just remain to be white and heteronormative. There are so many people affected by endometriosis in the UK that are beyond those labels. We recognize that we're not the experts, so we want to get the correct information, the pathways, especially navigating the NHS for people that don't have English as a first language, um, and especially those that are on visas in the UK, because they're still here, they still deserve support, they still need NHS guidance and support. So we really want to get them to understand how to work with the NHS and getting the support they need. And we really need to start acknowledging medical gaslighting for people of colour and LGBT communities going forward because it's a real thing and it is happening. So for us, the future, endometriosis, while as a debilitating condition, needs to be understood through an intersectional lens. And that's how we will appreciate the additional barriers to healthcare. We don't expect all of you to understand that. We don't expect everyone to know that. But what we expect is for you to work with those communities of colour so you can understand that better, those minority communities, LGBT communities, because without their voices and their journeys, we won't be able to make care that's actually accessible for everybody. Um, and as everybody has said in the panel before me, education around reproductive wellbeing generally will make such a difference within this space inclusive support with those with endometriosis. More, for me and our charity, more funding needs to be put into working with community of color and the LGBT community, because these are the communities that are often said to be hard to reach or hidden in plain sight, but I'm, I'm right here. We're right in front of you. We just need someone to work with us in a different way. And, and that's all we ask. Um, one of our biggest things this year is going to be, um, and we've launched it for Endometriosis Awareness Month, we're calling on the support of everybody to push our inclusive care campaign because everybody should be afforded the same access to treatment and support regardless of background. So if you want to know more or get in touch, here are my details, but that's it from me. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Well, Neelam, thank you so much for your presentation and for being the voice of those people who feel that no one's listening to them. And uh, Neelam, if you could let the Secretariat have a copy, please, of the slides you used, because I would like my parliamentary colleagues to see them. I mean, the, the, the facts you gave us about childbirth and sectioning were truly shocking. And thank you for educating us all about the term medical gaslighting. Um, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, look, I, I, I deliberately didn't cut off any of our four speakers. I know it hasn't left a, a great deal of time for questions, but I thought the four presentations were so good. It, it was just incredibly important that, that, that you heard what they had to say. So with uh, permission, and I hope we can technically do this, uh, if the meeting could overrun just by five minutes, to five past five, I can see Emma's nodding that that's okay, or otherwise there won't be any questions at all. Uh, I've been asked the first three, although Larissa is going to help me with the middle one. First, mm, what is your right. parliamentary group and the government doing to tackle diagnosis time? It hasn't changed in a de uh, decade. Well, I, I sort of answered that in my um, opening re remarks. Um, the all-party parliamentary group uh, was appalled by these times and we've asked for a commitment of four years or less by 2025 and a year or less by 2030. So moving on to the second one, it's for you and I, Larissa, uh, and it's what is going on with operations and appointments due to coronavirus um, and will this change when the rules change? So as far as what the government thinks about it. We, the government's been absolutely delighted with the success of the vaccine 
rollout. I mean, we can argue about what happened before then, but it's been absolutely brilliant across the country. And I absolutely agree that as surgeries and appointments resume, it is vital that those with, and, and I, I, I know uh, Amy touched upon it at the start, uh, I absolutely uh, agree that um, as we uh, come out of this, this lockdown, then we've got to get on with the uh, treatments. And the government has said that it will be working with the National Health Service, Larissa, to mm. um, manage the impact that the pandemic has had. But Larissa, what, what's your view? Mm, I, yeah, I absolutely agree, Sir David. I think it, it's it's a real priority that we now have to start looking at the number of cases because they are in their millions of people who are waiting to be seen by a doctor and who are waiting to receive treatment. And of course, a huge number of those uh, women and girls will potentially have endometriosis or have conditions related to their periods or um, abdominal pain and it's really really necessary that they see a specialist for all of the reasons that we've mentioned and that they also get the appropriate treatment that they need because otherwise you know they're going to be further marginalized and sidelined as they have been all along with with this kind of condition and as women's health has tended to be in the past so I, I don't know the exact figures I know that um, you know in total there are millions of people on that waiting list we haven't every hospital has been slightly different um you know where i am at the moment we are about to start resuming hopefully some normal elective lists and clinics um, but the majority of hospitals have had to run what are called resilience and emergency rotors so just covering emergencies simply because a lot of staff have had to be redeployed to cover the covid situation and so we've had to keep our 24-hour services and the cancer services running um, but sadly yes it has meant lots of people haven't had access to treatment and to diagnosis and that has to change as a priority as soon as it's safe to do so well larissa thank you for explaining that to everyone and then i've been asked would i uh, the all-party parliamentary group commit to writing to the department for health to improve mental health support for those with endometriosis and of course needham touched on that and the answer is absolutely yes and we will agree that at our next meeting now ladies and gentlemen i mean we've got 20 questions which we can't possibly do in uh, five minutes uh, emma supported by Faye is going to make sure that you get answers in any case and I think Emma's already been typing them I'm just going to go through the names and uh, perhaps Amy and Neelam if you want to try uh, chime into anyone so we've got an um, anonymous person who's been saying they've had bad chronic flare-ups for the past nine years and they've got a duplex kidney and over the past six years all sorts of problems um, what what can be done now and that with with their particular issues and another anonymous attendee says is there any uk research for endometriosis developing in the utero i mean larissa could you answer that yeah, that, that's a really good question. And the answer is yes. Um, there's lots of current research looking at whether there are external factors or environmental factors that could affect gene expression in utero. So as um, a, a female is developing in the womb. Um, and, you know, this is the whole premise of why we talk about how important it is that when a woman is pregnant, she looks after herself and that we advocate and support women during their pregnancies. Um, most of all, because we think that there's a direct correlation between some of the things that, that, that the woman could be exposed to while she's pregnant and then um, the, the, the actual health of the child. Um, and sometimes we don't necessarily see this until much later down the line. Um, we don't have any exact evidence behind this at the moment, but we, we do suspect that there are certain triggers and external factors that might be affecting gene expression in utero um, and this is a really kind of um, modern way of looking at endometriosis and something I hope will invest more funding into and more research because we need to get to the bottom of it and specifically what we can do about it how we can affect that gene expression for the better and, and, and stop any effects that might lead to endometriosis later down the line. Thank you for that, Larissa. And Lizzie Smith uh, really has asked a sort of question about research. We've got an anonymous attendee talking about their experiences and losing their father in 2010. Awful. Another anonymous attendee saying, can share the evidence regarding the impact on brain structure. Another anonymous attendee saying, 
Are there any endometriosis workplace policy as I'm now facing disciplinary action? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, another person saying, I have no shame in showing my bits, et cetera, but I am scared of every appointment now because of the pain and I'm starting to feel like giving up. Oh dear, that person really needs support. Another anonymous person saying, what possible scientific avenues, therapeutic interventions are there? Martha Bennett saying how she would like to know how much our GPs and doctors are taught about endometriosis, which one of our speakers touched on. Um, Amy Jane, uh, quality of life for the individual, not as a reproducer, yes. Naomi has said, uh, I was diagnosed in 2014. She had three surgeries and saying, you know, hysterectomies at 28 years of age just aren't the answer. Laura has thanked everyone for their contribution. Uh, SA again has thanked everyone for their contribution. Another anonymous person talks about their fertility. Lisa Watkins has thanked everyone for their contribution. Angela uh, talks about the pain issue. Sarah Leach has asked about research again. Another anonymous attendee has said, um, what can be done about receiving uh, their PIP, if endometriosis is classified as a disability, good question. One exactly. for the can, I, can I intercept, can I inter interrupt on that one? Um, yeah. Because I know it's a really tough one on, this is about people receiving PIP, so personal independence payment, if I get that right, or, or disability benefit. And the thing is that some people do get it with endometriosis, it's not excluded, but it's not included. So the in general terms of this, um, the Act says that if you are disabled by a condition, you should be able to receive benefit. So um, some people have successfully done it. I think we've all heard that um, uh, that people can find it hard. And I think, Sir David, with your permission, this is maybe something that we could get the APPG oh, to no, definitely. on that one. Definitely. Yeah, no, thank we you can provide that. information on that. Yeah, look, as I go through it, uh, please uh, uh, interrupt me. Uh, an anonymous person, can the HCP give nutritional health to help um, uh, Eliza Ward, what can we do to educate healthcare professionals on menstrual wellbeing? Another good point. Sharon Mitchell, thank you for the eye-opening ceremony. I, I, I want our speakers to know that our, our 200 attendees have really appreciated mm -hmm. it. Another one saying, are there any plans for improving treatment in the near future? Molly Cooper has said, can you get endo in your tubes? I think Emma will have to respond to, to that one um, and talks about rudeness of people when they're being examined. Victoria uh, again has praised all the speakers. Uh, Jackie is the condition hereditary and any research. So I, I, I think Emma, we can't just rush through the replies. I think if Amy makes some closing remarks and if Neelam, if you want to make some closing remarks as Larissa and I've had a go, Amy. Um, I think one thing as you were going through the questions that came up quite a few times, people have been sharing their experiences of being referred to um, um, gastroenterology or a urologist and they've been referred to multiple different departments and then them hitting a dead end and feeling like it's over and not knowing how to start again. Do not feel ashamed or do not stop at that hurdle of you know, having to almost start again, it's going to be a long process. But if you know deep down that something isn't right, go back to your GP, try and speak to another GP, get a second opinion and request that you're seen by a gynecologist primarily. I'm not absolutely, I'm not a healthcare professional, but this is something that obviously I get a lot of messages speaking about endometriosis so openly using my social media. I get a lot of messages from um, young girls, from people who are much older and they say, I just don't know where to start. And I always say, try and insist on a gynecological referral and be really, really thorough with any data that you can collect. There's brilliant apps available that you can download on your phone to map your cycle. Establish what your normal is. And if that doesn't fall, as you feel, into not into the predominant normal, into everyone else's average, then show that to your GP so that when you're in your appointment, you can say, oh, actually, I can tell you exactly when my last period was. I can tell you that I had severe pain with my bowel movement on this day, um, that my ovulation, when I think it is, unless you're actually testing for when you ovulate, you know, when you imagine to be ovulating, that that is particularly painful for me. Be as thorough as you can so that when you're sat in your appointments, you can't just sit there 
take on all this information and then leave not knowing where to start be a participant in those appointments and keep going back again and again um i, I personally I know this is something that we talked about i i think i spoke to 11 different gps and four or five different gynecologists and they were all at multiple hospitals and different practices um that is including ultimately i ended up as i say going on private health care unfortunately but um it is just about constantly it's exhausting but constantly constantly um, advocating for yourself and being armed with that knowledge you know they say stay away from google but more often than not it's a shame that that is what we're left with we have to go on the internet we have to find out what's going on and we have to go to our appointments saying i would like to look into this can i ask you these questions and i think it's about participating in those appointments as much as you can but don't give up if you know deep down that something is wrong then then don't give up but at the same time you know um, I was going to make a point about mental health as well. You know, your GP can advise you. Um, your GP, your GP can talk to you about your mental health just in your appointments. Um, but you can refer yourself um, for mental health help. Obviously, we want it to become an integrated part of care. It, it needs to be a part of the journey. As I say, it can't be two separate things: the physical impact and the mental impact. Um, eventually, it does need to be integrated into your whole journey. Um, but you can seek that out yourself and use it as part of a toolbox, try and remove that stigma for yourself as well so that, you know, like I say, you've got your, your knowledge that you're going to arm yourself with, your mental health support that you might be able to give um, and make um, available to yourself and keep talking about it with, you, with your friends and family if you're able to do so. Well, politicians such as myself, Amy, just won't be able to give the messages that you've given. You will be listened to and people will connect with you. So thank you for sharing that with everyone that's good advice. And ne Neelam, did you have any final closing remarks you'd like to make? Uh, yes, so what I'd like to say to everyone is, this is not an easy journey for anyone. It really isn't. But there's, there was nearly 200 people in this meeting today. All our voices, including all of them other ones, those minority communities, every single one of us together can make such a difference. Um, so keep advocating, but don't forget if you're in a um, place of privilege, if you've got a position of power, please advocate for people like me, you know, people of color, LGBT communities, because we need you to. So anything you can do, please. Thanks. Well, look, I would like to thank our four speakers this this afternoon. You've been absolutely wonderful and uh, it's been such a worthwhile meeting. I want to thank you, Emma, for your leadership of this organization and although we can't see the picture of Faye she's been working very busily in the background to make sure that uh, everything is right technically so before we say goodbye I would like to highlight that as I mentioned in my introduction the recommendations for our, our inquiry call on the government to make a commitment to reduce diagnosis times for endometriosis so ladies and gentlemen if you want to get involved you can do so by writing to your own MP. And I'm uh, very, very happy to uh, hear from any of the people that I represent. I've been pleased to see so many of my parliamentary colleagues who increasingly are showing their support for endometriosis. We all need education on the subject. Members of parliament have, have no real expertise in, in this particular area. Uh, and I, I'm very grateful for everyone's support for Endometriosis Awareness Month on social media. And if you should need a template to write to your MP, there is one available on the Endometriosis UK website. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>